Uh, hello, uh, welcome to the first of the multiple lectures today uh, on uh, grand universal decoding. Um, this first lecture is an overview of entropy. If you have already taken a course uh, in information theory where you have covered entropy, you can probably skip this lecture and go directly to the second lecture on grand. Um, if you have not taken such a course, or if you feel that you need a refresher, uh, please uh, do watch uh, this brief introduction, which should give you all the elements you need to understand the rest of the course. So um, what we're going to do today is uh, just, as I mentioned, uh, look at entropy just as a very a simple overview, and in particular, uh, for us to understand the elements that we will need for uh, the general counting, um, approximate uh, probabilistic counting um, properties that we'll use uh, for grant. Okay, so a short overview of entropy. So what is entropy? Entropy is a measure of average uncertainty, which is associated with a random variable. I'll usually use um, the nomenclature where a random variable is denoted by a capital letter, so capital X here. Uh, I'll have sample values shown as little x, and I'll usually use this calligraphy, which I'll call Cal X, uh, using the LaTeX notation uh, for the set from which uh, the sample values can be drawn. Uh, when I'm using a discrete random variable, we'll be using a capital P sub X as the probability mass function associated with the random variable capital X. You can interpret this as the probability that capital X takes on the value little x. So this is what the entropy of a discrete random variable is. It's always non-negative. Uh, and I can look at uh, not just a single random variable, but of course, I can consider a set of random variables, uh, an ordered set, a, a vector, um, and I can look at the joint, uh, the joint uh, probability mass function, and thus compute the joint probability from that pro probability mass function, the joint entropy h of x, y. Okay, um, it's important also for us to understand conditional entropy, which is going to be the expected value of entropies calculated according to conditional distributions. So when I write h of x given x, what I mean is, let me look at it, the probability mass function of y for a particular value of x, which let's call here, I'm varying that value of x as being z. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm taking the expectation of all the possible values that x can take, and I'm looking at, for each value of x, the conditional probability mass function of y condition on that value of x, and then I'm taking the average of, of the weighted average, the expectation of all, all of those uh, possible values of x, uh, each values of x gives me a particular p conditional PMF of y. That conditional PMF of y gives me a particular entropy. And I'm looking, therefore, at the expected value of all of these different entropies, where each entropy corresponds to a different realization of x. Okay? So that's what this conditional... Um, um, value with this conditional um, entropy is, okay? So intuitively, this is the average of the entropy of y given x over all possible values of x, ponderated, weighted by the probability of x. Okay, one of the really important aspects of entropy of uh, at least discrete entropy uh, is that uh, there, is, there are convexity uh, um, uh, properties, uh, and that's why we can invoke Janssen's inequality. Let's remind ourselves of what is Janssen's inequality. If I have a convex function uh, and x is a random variable, then Janssen's inequality tells us that the expectation of the function is greater than or equal to the function of the expectation, okay? So for any 
uh, convex function, uh, that is the case. And um, what that means is that in terms of a corollary for us, if I look at uh, f of x as being this function minus x log of x, then I can think of entropy as being the function of p of x. Let's go back to what the definition here was, okay? So here's a definition of h of x. So you see that if I consider p of x here as being the variable, then um, h of x here is the function of p of x summed over all of the possible values of x in cal x, okay? Now, if I look at f of x, which is this minus x log x, then, and if I compute its first derivative, what do I see? Well, this is the first derivative, which is mechanistically go through taking this function and taking the derivative. And the second derivative is negative. So what does that mean that the second derivative is negative? It means that uh, this function f is concave. Um, let's take a quick minute here to draw what we're talking about. So if I have a function that is convex, what I have is if I have here little x, and if I have here the function f of little x, then a convex function looks like this. And if I look at, say, two possible values of x, say, x1 and x2, OK? Then the any average of x1 and x2, any convex combination, uh, which would be, for instance, the expectation of x if I only had these two possible values taking some uh, probability, each of them between 0 and 1, and the probability is, of course, have to sum up to 1. So let me take some average here. So this point here would be some theta x1 plus 1 1 minus theta x2 if i have this this point here um, then what does Jensen's tell us if it's convex is that this point here, which is, what is this point? This is F of, let's call this point X prime. This is F of X prime. So if I look at that versus looking at the average here, if I look at this point, where this point here is theta times f of x1 plus plus one minus theta of f of x2. So if I look at this point here, 
this point is above that point. That's what convexity tells us um, with our Jensen's inequality. So think of this as the expectation of X and think of this as the expectation of F of X. If instead I have a concave function, instead I have a concave function, <clears throat> then what's gonna happen is now let me draw a line between this point here. Now this is f of x1 and this is f of x2. Let me draw that line. Then what will happen is that this point, which is f of x, theta f of x1 plus one minus theta f of x2. So this point here, just let's call this a different function. Let's call this g of x, the red one. So f of x is convex, g of x is concave, then theta times g of x1 plus 1 minus theta g of x2, which is this point over here. That point is actually going to be below this point here, where this point is g of x prime. Okay, so convexity means that the function of the expectation is below the expectation of the function. Concavity implies that the expectation of the function is below the function of the expectation. So, going back here to our entropy, since we have that the second derivative here of this f is negative, we have a function which is concave, and therefore the entropy of x is concave. What does it mean for the entropy of f to be concave? It means that um, if I take two random variables, x1 and x2, defined over the same possible set of sample values, cal x, uh, then if I take a probability mass function, which is a convex weighted average of the probability mass functions of the two random variables, x1 and x2, then what will happen is that the entropy of x, which is uh, the function of the expectation base, the function of the average, is going to be greater than or equal to the average of the functions, okay? So think back to the picture that we just saw because we have a concave function that we're working over, then the function of the mean is above the mean of the function, okay? So what does that mean in terms of some properties of h of x? Well, um, if I have two random variables which are not uniform, uh, it means that averaging those probability mass functions is going to, and getting a new random variable, is actually going to lead to a random variable with higher entropy. 
I can keep doing this over and over again and just bumping up the value of my entropy until I can bump it up no more. And when can I bump it up no more? I can bump it up no more when I actually have a uniform distribution. If I take the average of two probability mass functions, which are both uniform over the set Cal X, then the resulting probability mass function that comes from averaging those two is also uniform. I can go no further. So this uniform distribution, this uniform probability mass function over Cal X actually maximizes entropy. That is, if you will, the worst case in terms of entropy for this Cal X is if we have uh, uniform or the best case, depending on whether you're max wishing to maximize or minimize entropy. And what is the uh, what is the uh, entropy of a of a uh, x which has a uniform distribution over Cal X? Well, the notation here of these bars is cardinality of Cal X. What we're going to have is, if you just pop it into here, is that p of x here would be 1 over cardinality of cal x. Um, and if you just pop that into this, uh, into this formula, you see that I have uh, a sum. You can pop it directly into this formula here. Basically, this would be 1 over cardinality of cal x. And this would be log of uh, 1 over uh, cardinality of cal x. And therefore, I would just get uh, cardinality of cal the log of the cardinality of cal x. OK? So just, just to remind ourselves, basically, what I would have here is that p of x in the uniform case is 1 over the cardinality of cal x, OK? And therefore, if I just pop that into here, I would get that h of x is equal to log of cardinality of cal x. The one over here is going to be taken care of by the minus. All right. So Moving forward. Okay. So we have now an understanding of what entropy is and what its maximum value is and of the fact that it has this concavity property. Let's remind ourselves of this definition of conditional entropy. What we had in this definition of conditional entropy was remember that I had a different conditional entropy of y conditioned on each and every possible value that x took. Okay, and I'm just rewriting here in expanded form what this formula is. Okay, so I'm averaging and ponderating over all the possible values of x. I'm weighting by the probability of x. And here I have just the h of y condition on the capital on, a, on the random variable x taking on that particular sample value, little x. Okay, now. If I look at this formula and I look at this P of X and I look at this P of Y given X, what I see is that I can combine all of these 
and I can combine all of these, basically uh, rewriting using the fact that P of Y by the theorem of total probability is just P of Y given X multiplied by P of X and sum over all the possible values of X in Cal X, okay? So now if I look at this, what do I see? I see that because of the concavity of entropy that we just discussed, it has to be that h of y is greater than or equal to h of y given x. Why is that? Because remember that the we had a concavity property, and therefore in one case here we have that h of y is the function of the average, whereas here, this is the average of the function, okay? Um, again, the average is now computed over different possible, over the different x's. So what does that mean? If I look at the difference between h of y and h of y given x, then it has to be greater than or equal to zero. This difference, by the way, is by definition called the mutual information. So the notation that we use for mutual information is i of x given y. The mutual information is actually symmetric, okay? So it doesn't matter whether you write i of x, uh, i of x and y, or i of y and x. Um, it's, it's not a given, sorry. It's, a, it's just a semicolon, which is the way that we, we denote mutual information. So i of x, y, i of y, x, they're both the same. Okay, so this is a very simple corollary of the fact that entropy is a concave function. Um, and in effect, we get it directly from this definition of conditional entropy. Uh, another corollary of the concavity of entropy is the following. If I take... Um, the joint entropy of multiple random variables, say x1 through xn. If I write out what this is, you can actually find that it's the sum of xi, condition, uh, the entropy of xi, condition on all previous x's, so x1 through xi minus one. Uh, and if I look at this, uh, if I look at this um, sum, then recall that each of these elements here because of this conditioning reducing entropy property, um, then each of these uh, h of x i is conditioned on past uh, previous uh, x's, the uh, x1 through x i minus one, each of these is less than or equal to h of x i, okay? So this is the property, these are all both the non-negativity of mutual information and this independence bound. Uh, both of them, uh, both of them are corollaries of the concavity of entropy. Why do we call this independence bound? Well, what would happen is that this bound would be met with equality if all of these x's were independent. Uh, if x1 and x2 are independent, So h of x1 condition on x2 is equal to h of x1 when x1 and x2 are independent. So because of this, it would be that this expansion here, this property, by the way, here 
is called the chain rule of entropy. Okay, so this is called the chain rule. Um, so this is uh, the fact that h of x1, h of x2, basically, if I'm conditioning on a new, on a random variable on which I'm independent, then of course, I'm not changing the probability mass function. And therefore, what would happen here is that if, say, y and x were independent here, what I would have is that p of y given x would just be p of y. This would also be p of y. Having this weighting out here by p of x wouldn't matter anyway, it would just basically summing by a sum by weighted elements that all sum up to one, not negative weighted elements that all sum up to one. And therefore what I would have is if y and x were independent, this would just be equal to h of y. Okay. So basically this independence bounds tells me that the joint entropy of a bunch of random variables which is equal to the, by the chain rule, the sum of conditional entropies uh, is upper bounded by the sum of the marginal entropies of the entropies of all the individual um, random variables. All right, so let me erase this. So we just have looked at a bunch of different properties of entropy. It's now time to go into the second part of our lecture where we're gonna look at the notion of a typical set, the sort of approximate counting I mentioned at the beginning. All right, in order to do that, I'd like us to go back and recall from our undergraduate probability course wherever we took it, there was probability, statistics, uh, different programs uh, cover this uh, under different guises. They all get to roughly the same place. Uh, let's recall this notion of a, a mean, okay? So let me look at a bunch of random variables, x1, x2, which are independent, identically distributed. Uh, if I look at uh, the mean of these var random variables, which I'm going to call our new random variable m sub n, if I look at the mean of n of these random variables xi, so I sum up all the xi's, I divide it by n, that gives me that, uh, ar that arithmetic mean of the xi's. Um, then what do we know? We know um, basically from our undergraduate course, that the probability that Mn is in value absolute away from mu, where mu is the mean of each of these axes. These axes, by the way, have a mean mu and a variance, which we're denoting in the usual way by sigma squared. The probability that this Mn deviates from mu by more than a certain value epsilon, whether it be uh, to the left or to the right of mu, it doesn't matter, we have the absolute values here, is upper bounded by uh, this variance of x, I should probably have written x here, this is variance of x, okay. Uh, deviates um, by this uh, mean mu by more than epsilon, um, with the probability is upper bounded by the variance of x divided by n epsilon squared. The variance of x over n is actually uh, the variance of mn. So if I were to uh, 
write the variance of Mn here. By simple properties of the variance of the sum of independent random variables, that is actually the variance of x over n. Why is that the case? Because the variance of the sum of the xn's is n times the variance of x. And then when I multiply a random variable by a constant here, 1 over n, then I multiply its variance, any second moment, by um, the square of the constant, in this case, 1 over n squared. Okay, So we've all seen this property. And based on this, uh, let's go ahead and figure out something interesting about entropy. And an interesting thing that we can say about entropy is the following. If x1 to xn are ID, so independent identically distributed, all with the same probability bias function p of x, let's assume it has a mean and variance, it doesn't matter too much for the time being, then what I have is that 1 minus n log of the joint p of x's is going to h of x in probability. Why is that? Um, the reason that is, is because This quantity here, 1 over n log of the p of x's, is the same thing as minus 1 over n times log of the product because these are all independent. So this is the product of the p of x's. And now what I can do is I can take this log of a product and rewrite it by taking the sum of the logs. So this product inside the log becomes a sum outside the logs. All right, and this, of course, is basically the same thing as what we saw in the previous slide, where this is now a sum of a bunch of ID random variables, where the random variables happen to be this log. And what is the statistical mean of the sum of random variables? Well, its, it's mean is actually the mu in this case is h of x, because h of x is the expectation of this log of the probability, minus log of the probability. So basically using exactly the same relations we saw before in the previous slide, we can say that this goes to that uh, in probability. Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're applying the weak law of large numbers, which I'm shortening here by WLLN. So it's the weak law of large numbers. Which is a very simple <clears throat> consequence of the relation I just showed to you before. 
Okay, so basically, as I mentioned, the way to think of this is I take a random variable, which has, um, which is basically takes the value y, which is log minus log of p of x, x, with probably p of x. The expected value of this random variable y is h of x, because of the definition of h of x. And now I apply the weak law of large numbers that we saw before um, to uh, in the previous slide to this new random variable y. And then I get that this quantity goes to that quantity. Okay, so then what? Well, what that means, I'm just expanding here what we just said in the last slide. So I have this log of the P of axis, which is because of the step that I showed you before where we go from log of p of x because they're independent to um, product of the p of x's, take that into, uh, take that outside, make the product in the inside of the log go to a sum on the outside. And so I have that this expectation of y, this new random variable is uh, going um, in probably it's going to h of x, okay? So the probability that h of x is different by more than some epsilon from um, this, uh, this uh, sum of one of our n, of one i from one to n of y i's divided by n, that that, the probability that that's uh, away by epsilon is going down to zero, the probability that difference is more than some epsilon uh, is going down to zero with n. Okay, so basically uh, the two values are getting arbitrarily close together with um, as n grows, uh, as n uh, grows. Okay. So. Now we're ready to get into this notion of the typical set, this sort of approximate counting, uh, which I mentioned to you will be important for us last, later. So I'm going to do a definition of this typical set, which I'm going to denote as A sub epsilon n. And the definition of the typical set is the following. It's the set of all the x's for which this probability of random variable x taking on the value little x is between these two values. It's upper bounded by two to the minus n hx minus epsilon and two to the minus n hx plus epsilon. A quick check here may look funny to have on the right hand side a minus epsilon and on the left hand side a plus epsilon, but don't forget there's a minus over here, okay? Equivalently, maybe an easier way of thinking of this is let me take logs everywhere. And what that is, it's the, a set of x's for which one minus log of the probability is between h of x plus epsilon and h of x minus epsilon, okay? So it's just all the x's for which the probability of the random variable x has this property. That is what I'm gonna call my typical set. So um, as n increases, uh, what happens is the bounds are getting closer. So we're considering a smaller range of probabilities. And basically what I have here is that these um, uh, these two uh, bounds here, this is one over 
2 to the n hx plus epsilon. This is 1 over 2 to the n hx minus epsilon. So as n is increasing, the right-hand side and the left-hand side of uh, of this uh, of this inequality are getting closer together. The left hand side, right hand side here are not getting closer together, but of course um, this in the middle is is changing. Okay, but if I look at this first equation, this first inequality, you see that the right hand side and the left hand side are getting closer together. Okay, um, I'm looking here at um, I'm going to remind you. I actually haven't shown it to you, but we're going to have a, a finite variance here on the entropy, so I'm able to apply um, the laws of large numbers. Okay, so how can I use these properties that we've just derived to say something interesting? And particularly, I have promised you at the beginning of this lecture something about some sort of approximate counting. So basically what I mean is I want to say something about the cardinality of this typical set. Remember that the notation we're using for cardinality are these straight lines. That's a standard notation for cardinality. Okay. Uh, let me start by stating something which is just obviously true. It's that the fact that if, that if I take the sum over all possible values of these vectors xn. Whereas here, remember each of these x's was in cal x, uh, the set of possible values. So if I look at the vector xn, I have to consider the Cartesian uh, product of this uh, cal x. So that's why I have these, all these vectors xn are now in this new expanded um, a sample value set, which is the Cartesian value of the um, Cal X for each of these individual X's. Uh, so if I look at the sum of the probabilities of all the possible values, that sum of the probabilities has to be one, okay? Uh, which means, of course, that if I consider a subset of all the possible values, and I'm going to consider that subset to be this typical set that I just defined. If I look at summing the probabilities over just the typical set, it has to be, of course, that, that sum of the probabilities is less than or equal to one. Moreover, let's recall that all the probabilities inside this typical set have a lower bound, which is given here. That was the left-hand side of what we saw in the previous slide. Um, and therefore, it has to be that the sum of this quantity here, this lower bound, over all of the elements in the typical set uh, has to be upper bounded by 1. Another way of rewriting the sum, since all of these elements have the same value, is that this is just 2 to the minus nhx plus epsilon. So remember the lower bound that we saw in the previous slide multiplied by the number of elements in the typical set, because that's how many times I'm summing up this value, okay? So a simple corollary of that is that the number of elements in the typical set, this cardinality, is upper bounded by 2 to the n hx plus epsilon, which is multiplied by 2 to the n hx plus epsilon, the right-hand side here, and the left-hand side here of this inequality, and I obtain this upper bound on the typical set. Okay, so now we got an upper bound on the typical set. Now, let's recall that the way we defined the typical set was that uh, it was, let's just let's go, it's worth it to, uh, Look at this. This is how uh, I had defined it. Um, and remember um, that from um, my arguments before as to um, the weak law of large numbers, it has to be that the probability of this mean uh, being away from, so this we call this um, 
uh, this uh, uh, sample mean being away from its um, statistical mean, which is h of x, um, that that probability is going to zero. And let me be a little bit loose here with how I'm defining my how I'm defining my epsilons. Um, we should really have two different epsilons, but you'll you'll cut me a bit of slack. Um, and basically, what we know is that that is have to happen with a probability that's going to one. Or another way of saying it is that the probability that this mean is more than epsilon away from its statistical mean, which is h of x, is going to zero. Or alternatively, it means that the probability of being in the typical set is going to one, it's greater than or equal to one minus some epsilon. So again, I'm using a single epsilon here. I should have to separate them all, but we, we can be a little sloppy because I can always take the, the largest of these epsilons um, and uh, I don't have to fuss too much. But really, the, uh, the weak law of large numbers was telling me that the probability of being in the typical set uh, was getting close to one, or alternatively had to be lower bounded by one minus some epsilon, okay? Um, so that's basically how we've combined this definition of the typical set, okay, with the fact that we know that this is going to that in probability. That's to me, that's to say that it's, you know, that I have this, uh, the, this um, uh, relationship. By the way, I didn't go into the Chebyshev's inequality because I presume you've seen it before, but let me just flash up this, uh, this slide to go and review uh, from your undergrad Chebyshev's inequality, which is what gave us this relationship, okay? Okay, so as I said, by giving ourselves a little slack about what we mean about these epsilons, what do we have? We have that the probability of being in the typical set, which is basically all the axes for which uh, the sample mean is going to go close enough uh, to the statistical mean h of x. Um, then what do we have is that this probability is greater than or equal to one minus epsilon. Another way of writing it is that one minus epsilon is less than or equal to the sum of the p of x's over all the x's inside the typical set. This right-hand side is just a rewriting of the probability of being in the typical set a sub epsilon n. Okay. Now, remember that every probability in the typical set had an upper bound. Go back here. This is the upper bound of the probabilities in of the axis in the typical set. So I'm going to replace this. I'm going to replace this with its upper bound. Okay. Um, and then what do I have? I have all these p of x's are replaced by this quantity. Now I have a sum of all the elements in the typical set of, um, of quantities that are all the same. So I can just replace the sum by multiplying by the number of elements in the typical set. So that's the cardinality of the typical set here. Um, and similar to what I did before, I'm going to multiply the left-hand side and the right-hand side by this quantity. So now I get a lower bound on the cardinality of the typical set, just to the nhx minus epsilon times one minus epsilon. So I have an upper bound here. I have a lower bound here. Okay, and you can see that as my epsilon is getting small, this upper bound and this lower bound are getting to be closer and closer together. So if epsilon were truly zero, then this upper bound and this lower bound would be the same. 
one of the things uh, to be careful about is our interpretation of typical. So for instance, is the most likely output typical? Uh, we'll see this in the next lecture uh, again, but the most uh, likely output usually it's not typical. So suppose that I have a random variable X, which is Bernoulli, suppose it takes uh, probability one with 10 to the minus uh, three, probably zero with probably one minus 10 to the minus three. This is say a very, um, very sensible model for uh, something like a channel with uh, bit errors, uh, with the probability of an error is 10 to the minus three. Uh, then what would happen in that case is that if I look at a string of n um, noises, the most likely string is all zeros. Uh, but of course, all zeros is actually um, not typical in the sense that the average number, the you know, it's, it has no no ones at all. Whereas usually, whereas the the typical set would have one thousandth of the elements be one. Okay, so generally what will happen is that typical does not mean most likely, the most likely uh, sequence is typically not, um, not, um, not typical, okay? One of the nice things about um, typical set is the following. Since I basically have, not just an upper bound, but more importantly in this case, an not just a lower bound, but more importantly, in this case, an upper bound, okay? If I give you uh, a set with a certain number of elements in it, how many bits do I need to represent elements of that set? Well, I never need more bits than the log of the elements in that set. So in, let's say, you know, round it up to plus one. So if I take the log, of the number of elements in the set. It's upper bounded by NHX plus epsilon, and let's add one more bit to for rounding errors of integrality. So basically what that means is to describe elements in the typical set, I never need uh, more than this number of bits. And if I want to describe uh, with high probability all possible elements, then with probably that's close to one I am in the typical set, right? And so I only need this many bits. Um, and what do I have for bits that are not typical? Well, I never need more than, of course, all the possibilities, which is log of cal the cardinality of cal x to the n, remember, it's that, um, uh, Cartesian product of the Cal X's. So this Cal X, it's cardinality of Cal X to the end of them. So N log cardinality of Cal X when I take the log plus one bits. So this is how much I need for things inside the typical set. This is how much I need for the, the things outside the typical set. This is how much I need, how many bits I need for things inside the typical set. Um, and that means that actually with high, with high probability, I only need a number of bits, which is uh, NHX, okay? Because the probability, even though this is big, the probability of being the atypical set is going to zero, and the probability of being the typical set is going to one. All right, uh, I'm gonna stop here and we'll continue uh, in the next lecture with uh, considering grant proper.